grateful to be in the house of the Lord. You feel something transitioning from the moment that you came into this room, from the moment that maybe you came on the premises. There's something that shifted in the supernatural. There's something that you sense that happened. You see, God's house and God's people, when they get together, powerful things can happen. When prayer is made, God can move. When praise is offered, God steps in. I'm saying something happens in just a few moments when we gather together under the banner of his name. There's power in this place right now. There's anointing resting in this room right now. Healing can happen in this place this morning. Just one more time, would you just bless the Lord with all that you have, with all your soul, with all your being, with all your might. With all your strength, with all your voice. I love you, Jesus. This is the day that you've made. We will rejoice. God, we will celebrate. The joy that I have, the world can give it. And you just got to get your mind made up that the world can't take it away doesn't matter what we walk through. Job said, though he slay me yet, will I trust him? He said, someone find me a rock. I want to write it down. My redeemer lives. I know that I know that I know. Doesn't matter what I'm walking through. Doesn't matter what I'm going through. I know that God's on the throne. I know that God's in control. I know that God's at work. My situation is just a stepping stone to the place that God has taken me. I don't understand it right now, but I know that he's working. I don't understand it with my mind, but in my spirit, there's something that resonates. There's a connection to the purpose of God. Oh yeah, someone just shout yes. You say, well, that's just a whole lot of cheerleading, Jack. Well, I'll tell you what, if we take cheerleading out of the word of God, we're going to have to take about half the Psalms out. We're going to have to take out part of Isaiah. We're going to have to take out part of the New Testament. We're going to have to take about, uh, we're just going to have a, a tattered old book that we're left with. But if we leave the times that God encourages us to worship Him, the times that we're to encourage one another to rejoice in what God has done, to celebrate the way God has moved. Something happens when we begin to do what God has challenged us to do in the Word of God. We've said it over and over and over again about how God knew what He was doing when He put us on the hill with a bunch of ball fields because we just get excited just like them. We get a little bit ramped up just like them. And I was just taking that analogy in my head a little bit further while Pastor Matt was praying this morning. And I thought, you know, God, people celebrate in the stands. People celebrate on the sidelines. People celebrate there. They're on the bench while they're cheering their teammates on. But there's something about it that when that, that batter, he bats, he gets a ball out the field. And he's running for the base. And, and maybe it's a bit of a tight moment. Maybe someone, the shortstop, caught it. And he's just about ready to drill that ball back to first base to catch the, the runner as he's running to first base. And, and it is a tense moment because the ball's coming and the runner's coming. And people, they just don't know what's going to happen. But when that runner, if he can touch the bag, maybe on first base he can overrun the bag a little bit. He can get beyond it. But the moment that he touches the bag before the ball gets in the hand of the first baseman, that umpire, he says... Any ball players in the room? Anybody know that I'm telling the truth? Anybody know that's the truth? If you can beat the ball to the base, you're safe. Well, someone, you came into the house of God this morning and you escaped a whole lot. A past, you hate, you escaped a whole lot in your present. And when you got into the house of God, the enemy tried to chase you down. Your past tried to haunt you. But I'd just like to make a quick declaration. I think I just kick it. I'll be umpire for a moment. You're safe. Just look at your neighbor and say it's safe. We're in the house of God. You're safe. You made it. We're here. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Because the moment I got my foot in the room, you're safe. You can't touch him. He's not out. It's not over. It's not finished. It's safe. It's time to play ball, church. I 
just, I just need someone in the audience to do that for a minute. Look at your neighbor and say, oh, the enemy came, but it's, the enemy fought me, but I made it to the house of God. I came to get a word from God. I, my mind tormented me all week, but I, fought me all week but I, I, we, we worship a God that can turn it around look at your neighbor and say God's turning it around 41 in Swahili service right here last evening can you say God's turn <laughs> 52 on the bus this morning 52 people made it, made it to the house of God that maybe they couldn't have before. But God made a way in the middle of no way. The enemy fought, but God moved in. We are in the house of God. Psalm 126, if you would turn there with me. When the world all around us is sinking sin. I, I was singing that right along with O'Neill this morning. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand when I need a shelter, when I need a friend, when I need to get to the rock. Psalm 126, verse 1, we are praying for Pastor this morning. He's with Brother Jeff Arnold in Gainesville, Florida. Aren't you glad to be a part of a fellowship of 4,600 churches? That means that we got a lot of places to visit. We got a lot of people to come and visit. We're a part, and that's just one group of apostolic believers. We're part of the worldwide church that God has prepared for this day, for this age, for this time. That excites me just a little bit. Psalm 126, verse 1. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Verse 4, turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You see a bit of paradox among the feeling that we see in the, in the psalm right here. How that sometimes what seems like weeping, God turns to joy. And what seems like captivity is just an opportunity for God to do something miraculous in our midst, in our lives, in our families, in our community. So if you would just for a few moments this morning believe with me that God is turning it around. Would you just find a neighbor you haven't talked to yet and just tell him, say, God's turning it around. God's turning it around. Amen. Everyone say, in Jesus' name. And you may be seated this morning. The warning came to the ancient Israeli tribe from old by the word of Moses. He said, disobedience will bring the curse of God, and obedience will bring the blessing of God. He said, your disobedience, part of the curse is that you'll be dispersed amongst the nations, people who don't understand who you are, people who don't understand what you possess, people who don't understand your past, the purchase that's been made, who you really are, my people. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 3, it says that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion on thee. He said that in the midst of your captors, he would create a way of escape. That in the moments that you would find yourself amongst those that didn't understand who you were, those that would put you in captivity, he said that God would turn the captivity around. He said that he would have compassion and we would turn them from, return them from, and gather them from all the nations whither the Lord, the God, their God, had scattered them. Captivity. What a horrible thought. You know, as wild as the world is getting around us, the turmoil and the headlines from Dallas this week, 
Every day we have indicators to let us know that we are, in fact, in the end times. And as a church, we've got to realize that none of this is catching God by surprise. We aren't here by accident, but God has empowered us and positioned us for such a time as this. But, you know, as, uh, as we go through reading the news, and it doesn't take every day there is news, there are headlines that catch our attention, and, and it's just a simple swipe on our phone, or it's a headline in the newspaper that lands on our doorstep in the morning that, that it catches our attention. But out of all of those, I think one thing that, that usually grabs my mind is that of kidnapping. Because I can't imagine what it would be like to be in the hands of a captor. I can't imagine what it would be like. And, and uh, you know, <clears throat> I don't even really want to go there. You know what I mean? You don't want to go there in your mind. But it was, it was uh, early this year that I woke up in the middle of the night. I, I had dreamt that Kristen, Kristen's my daughter, that her and I, I, I don't know where Kathy and Justin were, but in my dream, it was Kristen and I that were close together. We were here, we were together in an airport somewhere, and it was a place that I remember I wasn't familiar with. And in my dream, I was looking around for instructions, perhaps maybe about where a flight what there would be to catch or directions to a gate. Everyone say this was a dream. Okay, just so you don't. <clears throat> and so I was uh, trying to figure out maybe it was directions to the gate. And when I turned my head, I heard this cry from my daughter. And when I turned to where she had just been moments ago in my mind, in my dream, she was gone. And through the crowd of people, I, I heard her crying out for me. And I, I began to run in my dream toward the sound of her voice. And, and I caught a glimpse of her. She was fighting and struggling with a, a strong man who was pulling her outside. And I was climbing over top of people. I was, I was pulling the, uh, the security to come and, and aid me and assist me and help me. And I, I, was, I was panicked. I was upset. And in, in my dream, I, was, I, I remember struggling and fighting. And, and as she disappeared out of sight is the moment that I woke up. And... Uh, you know, I was, it was in that moment where you're still, you're, you're, you're half crying because you're upset and you don't understand you're, you're, you're coming out of your dream into reality. And, and in that moment, I remember being so glad that this was just a dream. It was so real to me. You know, I was glad and I was mad. And I remembered a little advice that I've kind of held on to. I, I remember Brother Stone King telling us when, when we were just newly married couples, he was talking about dreams, and he said, the good ones that come from God, you need to stand on them and claim them. And the bad ones, he said, he said you just kind of need to rebuke it and plead the blood. And so I remember waking up that morning, and, and in those moments where I was so confused, and in that moment where I was so upset, and I was, I was glad to be awake in the fact that it wasn't true, and I was upset mentally because of what I just experienced, and, and what I, I was fearful of, and what, what fear that placed in my spirit, and fear that placed in my mind. I, I began to rebuke it, and I prayed about it. I prayed over my daughter. I prayed God's covering on her. I prayed the blood over her. I, I, I spoke against the dream, and, and you know, probably if Kathy had woke up in those few moments, she would have thought that I was a little bit crazy. And maybe just in case she did wake up, I told her the next morning, I said, I had the, I had the hor most horrible dream last night. I, I dreamt that Kristen was kidnapped, and it was just horrible. And I explained it to her, and then her, we both kind of, our eyes kind of opened up a little bit, and we thought about her coming trip to Spain that she was planning on, AYC. And part of me was going to be like... You have two options, I'm going, or we're not going at all. And so you kind of grapple with that men mentally, and, and you know, you know, no, we pleaded the blood, maybe that was just something I was fearful of, who knows why. You know, I've struggled for, uh, if there's any spiritual significance, God, reveal it, Lord, if it's uh, pizza, let me know that too. <clears throat> um, whatever it was, but I, I, you know, it was so... Uh, impacting to me, even though it wasn't true, it wasn't a reality, that it still has stuck with me till now. Because it would be horrible to be a captive. You see, the enemy, he loves to bring people captive. There's nothing he desires any more than for you to become under his control. The enemy's not interested in a collection of worthless or useless, useless articles. However, he is very interested in you. 
If, if anything, you, you should realize that his desire for your captivity is really an indicator of your validity. That you are valuable. That you are a treasure. That you are something that God has put his hand on, his price tag on you. He has redeemed you. He has purchased you. But the enemy's desire is to steal you. John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. But the enemy's desire is to steal. The enemy's desire is to kill. And the enemy's desire is to destroy. And we can see that as it plays out in our media about the facts that are happening around us. We can see it as it happens in the world about us. That the enemy is working his ways. But we are living <clears throat> in perilous times. 2 Timothy chapter 3, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. I'm going to take a moment and read part of this chapter because I want the reality of what we are living in to settle on us. Is that okay? Can, can we just kind of engage in the word of God? I mean, this is life this morning. There's something powerful in this word. It's a lamp that's going to shine a light on somebody's path today. It's going to open a door that seemed impossible to open. It's going to turn the situation around for somebody this morning. If you'll let it, God is about to turn it around. But just so we understand exactly where we are, it's perilous times. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemer, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of them that are good, Tra traitors, high, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Paul said, Timothy, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away by diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. Say, God is going to turn it around. Paul said to Timothy, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, my charity, my patience, persecutions and afflictions, which come unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Now just get this for me, would you? But out of them all, everyone say all, the Lord delivered me. In other words, Paul was saying there's some horrible things that are going to happen. There's some horrible things that have happened. But you've got to realize, Timothy, in the midst of it all, I'm working my plan. In the midst of it all, I'm able to deliver. It doesn't seem, even though it seems like the enemy's captive plan is working its greatest work, I'm telling you that God is able to deliver. He tells him, verse 14, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Verse 16, he said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, matured, accomplished, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The plan that God has in the midst of everything that's happening is so that we will find strength power and resistance in the word of God to overcome the enemy of our soul. No matter how great the trouble, no matter how great the trial, no matter how perilous the times are that are coming, he said, you just hang on, Timothy, because the word of God is able to establish you. It's able to strengthen you. It's going to put a steel rod up your backbone, and it's going to square your shoulders. And when the enemy advances, you're going to fight the good fight of faith. That's not the time to give up. That's not the time to turn around. It's the time to watch God work the miracle that he's able to work and turn it all around the attack of worldly humanity and our spiritual en enemy will be the same it's to put us in some kind of captivity but can I just remind the church this morning that God is just going to use it to bring us to a place of spiritual maturity and a place of spiritual authority God can turn it around I know what it looks
looks like on the outside. Sometimes our natural inclination is just to go find a corner and hold out until God shows up. But God is saying, church, this isn't what we ought to be doing. We got to get out in the middle and begin to preach and declare the powerful word of God because there's too many people captive that God wants to set free. Verse 1, when the Lord of Psalm 126, he said, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. The same way that I had that bad dream. God wants to give us good dreams. God wants to, to bring some idea into our spirit about what he's able to do. God wants to bring some vision into our mind about what he wants to do amongst us, what he wants to do through us. God wants to release some people that are captive today. You say, well, I don't have any chains. I'm not captive by... Some people are captive in their mind. Some people, you're captive in your spirit. You haven't been able to feel God the way that you want to feel him for a long time because the enemy moved in and he's captivated you. You're captive by the wrong mentality. You're captive by lack of faith. You've got doubt in your mind and God's wanting to release somebody this morning and let faith take its proper place in your spirit and let faith take its proper place in your mind so you can believe God for more we're overcomers by the word of our testimony and by the blood of the lamb we got to remind ourselves about what God has done in our past when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion. We've got to remind ourselves of how God saved us, how God redeemed us. We've got to remind ourselves of what life was like before God moved in, but God stepped on the scene, but God brought healing, but God brought deliverance, but God washed us with his blood. We were like them that dream. God wants to give us dreams of the great things that he has in store for the church. Joel 2, 28, it will come to pass afterward. He said, your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Man, I looked in the mirror yesterday and I told Kathy, I said, it's almost all gone. She knew exactly what I was talking about. That black hair I used to have. The sun was streaming in the window. And I was looking in the mirror, in the rearview mirror, and I was like, she said, well, there's still some back here. I don't know if she's telling the truth or not. I'm too scared to look. But it may be that I'm moving out of the realm. How many gray hair jokes can we have anyway? Just one more. I, I may be moving from young man into the realm of middle-aged man. <laughs> Different hats we're wearing. I'll have to pull out my middle-aged man cape. The one with the pictures of everything we want in our middle age, the red sports car and the, anyhow. Maybe it's a little premature, but I do know this. I want God to give me some dreams. I do know this. I, I, I want God to deposit something in our spirits that we haven't seen yet. I, I'm so incredibly grateful for what God has done. But I am anticipating what God has yet to do. There's something in our spirit that is just leaping out, crying out, hungry for more of God than we have ever had before. God, give us dreams of things that we haven't seen yet. God, use those dreams to condition our mind for the great thing that you are about to do. God, would you use those dreams to inspire us? 
for more of you than we've ever had before. God, would you use those dreams? God, would you give us those visions of things that we have yet to see? But God, would you give us dreams of some things that, that, that God, you just kind of blow our minds with the same way that, that some, some of those dreams can impact us in the natural I pray that God gives us a supernatural dream from him that will condition us so that we can anticipate something greater from God than we have ever seen before. Because when we speak it in the natural, our natural mind is resistant to it because we can't believe it. We're too fearful to believe it. Our faith can't reach out past it. But if God can give us a dream of what he's going to do, the same way that I woke up startled, the same way that I woke up upset, the same way that I woke up both mad and glad, I believe that God wants to give us supernatural dreams that wake us up in the middle of the night and we say God is that something that you're really wanting to do God are you really wanting to raise the dead are you really wanting to open minded eyes and God conditions us into supernatural by a dream he prepares us for what he's about to do through us I believe that that is something that God wants to do God is about to turn us upside down until we don't even resemble the church that we used to be for the sake of the cause of the church that God wants us to become. Great things in store. God's going to pour his spirit out. But God is saying, we were like them that dream. We've got we've to let God begin to do something in us. God's going to do something through us. But first, he needs to do something in us. The seed has got to be birthed on the inside of us this morning. The psalmist went on. He said, when they begin to dream like that, when they, when they begin to remember about what God has done for them, he said, then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. He said, then said they among the heathen, the Lord has done great things for them. That the people that didn't, didn't even believe all of a sudden we're able to see, I, I believe, I think that that can happen. I think that people that aren't believers in the end times are going to look at the church and they're going to say, wow, this God that they serve is really doing some amazing things amongst them. That the heathen is going to get it before we do, maybe. That the unbeliever is going to see it before we completely understand it. The Lord has done great things for them. And then verse 3, we're going to catch on. And then we're going to declare, the Lord has done great things for us. Whereof we are glad. I think maybe it's going to happen in such a manner, in such a measure. I I'm trying to create a little bit of faith here this morning. Because I believe God has begun. And I believe that God is going to continue something in this room today. God started something. But God's about to complete something amongst us this morning. Oh, why don't, we, I, I, why don't we just pause for a minute, a minute? However you want to praise God, would you praise him for a moment? Would you lift your voice? Would you clap your hands? Would you raise your hands? Would you thank God that he's got something in store for an end time apostolic church? Something that we can't anticipate. But God, I pray that you would prepare us mentally for what you want to do in us spiritually. Come on, Apostolic Church, let it out just for a minute. If we could just come to the reality of who we are, we are God's church in the end days. God's got a plan for us. God's got a purpose for us. It was Brother Jimmy Tony. He was just here a few weeks ago. Everyone remember Brother Tony? Appreciate Brother Tony. He was just here a few weeks ago. He, he sent an out, a note out on Twitter that said this. He said, I am convinced that some today would have reasoned and felt justified by asking the Hebrew children to sit down and just not make a scene. Just bow. That's not what the church is called to do in this end time. It's time to stand up and it's time to speak up. It's time to make a scene a little bit this morning. While the church around us bows, it's time for us to declare the goodness of God, the purpose of God, and the plan of God in our lives. 
The Bible tells us that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse 20 of Daniel chapter 1, that they were ten times wiser than the people of the world. God wants to do that for this end time church. I believe that God can take an old man's wisdom and put it into young men in this end time. I believe that that is something that God will want to do if God can trust us. Daniel was given an anointing to influence the carnal, worldly, governmental influence of Babylon. 120 provinces. But he was a young man with old man's wisdom. He wasn't going to bow. Darius said, quit praying. But he made his mind up. The window is going to swing open just like it's done three times a day before. I'm not about to stop praying because God has something he wants to do right here, right now. It's not time to bend. It's not time to bow. And it's not time to burn. But church, it is time to pray. It's time for us to seek the face of God like we haven't ever sought the face of God before. The boys were cast in the fiery furnace. Daniel into the lion's den but the only thing that happened was that God showed up and turned it around the lion's mouth stayed shut the fire didn't burn and God showed up in the midst of the fire as the fourth man I'm saying that that's what God will do if the church will just stand up and make a declaration of who we are it's time to preach the unadulterated word of God it's time to preach the truth of regeneration it's time to preach the truth of sanctification it's time to preach the truth of salvation to a world that absolutely and desperately needs it in today. It's time, church, to preach it. I'm not talking about the pulpit. I'm talking about the pew. A simple declaration is what the world needs to hear. God is still on the throne, and he can turn it around. Nebuchadnezzar, you look pretty powerful. You got your band cranked up. You got the fire cranked up, but it doesn't really matter because you're not the one on the throne. Anyhow, I'm not careful to answer you in this manner. God's able. I don't know if he will yet, but this is what I know. He can, and if he does, then deliverance is ours because God can turn it around. God can turn it around. Psalms chapter 2, verse 1 to 7 says, Why does the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. But the Bible says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon the holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. I'm telling you, church, God is still on the throne. It doesn't matter what the Nebuchadnezzar is in the world. It doesn't matter what the... Call yourself Darius the king if you want to. We really have just one king on the throne. In this end time, last days, I am not remotely interested in floating down the lazy river of Laodicea. I say, come on, church, let's make some waves. It's about time that we take a pleasure craft and turn it into a war craft because there are some people that have been captivated that God wants to bring release to. It's time for the church to be the church. It was in Acts chapter 4 where the church began to experience persecution. Their prayer wasn't to slip under the radar and make the problem go away. Their response to persecution was to get in an apostolic Acts of the Apostles prayer meeting. And the Bible says, and prayer was made. Acts chapter 4 and verse 29, it says, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings. And they didn't say, grant unto thy servants peace. They didn't say, grant unto thy servants an escape hatch. They didn't say, grant unto thy servants a way out of this mess. But they did say, God, grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. And God is just looking for one man 
man or one woman in this end time, last day's age to stand up and say, I've been filled with a little bit of boldness. I got an attitude of gratitude. I'm overcoming by the power of the testimony and the blood of the Lamb. I believe that God is able. I'm saying that God wants to stand us up with boldness to speak the word of God. Can you take a praise break for just one moment? Don't let it break out. Let it break out for a minute. I, I just checked my phone. Don't worry. It's 12 o'clock right on the dot. But I wish there would be something that went down in the annals, the history of CCC, that at 12 o'clock, July 10th, the Holy Ghost stepped in overcame, over, overwhelmed, swept over the top of, blew the middle out of, upset us, turned us upside down. I wish that someone could say at 12 o'clock, God turned it around. It was just a Sunday morning service until God turned it around. It was just a normal come as you are. Oh, one more time. Lift your voice. Lift it. Ha ha. Come on, with boldness, declare him as a king. Make your mind up. I'm going to serve him in spite of. I'm going to serve him in the middle of. I'm going to praise him through the process until I see him work the way that he promised that he would work. In the last day, saith God, I will, I will, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. said there's just a fire that's beginning to stir up on the inside if someone would just say spring up oh well spring up oh well spring up oh well Come on, man of God. I would that men would pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath, without doubting. Come on, let's believe God. Let's believe God for a moment. Come on, women of God. Daughter of Zion, lift your voice for a moment. Come on, there's still power in the blood of Jesus. There's still power to overcome the enemy. There's still power to sigh. To silence the oppressor. <clears throat> it's the psalmist prayer in verse 4 that I really want to get to this morning. It's the next verse. We can go back to the music. The psalmist, his cry. Because you're saying this morning, I don't really feel that way yet. That's not how I, I feel this morning. I, I'm just a little bit under the weather. I'm a little bit under the gun. I'm just, I'm just I'm, I don't have the liberty that I'd like to have this morning. I, I, I don't feel what you're feeling, Pastor Jack. I don't sense it in the supernatural. Can I just say that God, I, I believe the way that he ordered this psalm was so that you and I could have a good reason to by the end of it. 
Because the psalmist went on to say, even though he's just declared about what God has done, his prayer from verse 4 to verse 6 was simply this. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. In other words, God, would you turn it around? Other versions of verse 4 give us a little more insight as to what the psalmist is referring to. Some versions define it and say the streams in the Negev, the wilderness of ancient Israel. And if Jerusalem is the heart of Israel, then the Negev is the wilderness or the womb of Israel. It's where God births what he wants to do in us. If Jerusalem was the heart of Israel, we read about it, we love it, pray for it. But the Negev, or the wilderness, was where God began everything significant that Israel ever became. The Negev is the only place that you'll find where both, where all three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, lived simultaneously. The wilderness. The wilderness where Moses and David both spent time waiting on God's purpose and plan for their life. Israel's 40-year wandering. The wilderness, then again, but the psalmist said, turn again our captivity as the streams in the south. And you say, well, what in the world is God talking about? What is the psalmist talking about? I did a little bit of research into that in the last couple of days. and What I found is that what happens in the wilderness is that a storm may happen miles away. But the water as it flows, some of the topography, it's unable to absorb the water because of everything that's gone on previously, whether there hasn't been any rain or hasn't been able to receive it. But the the flow will happen with such abundance that the ground isn't able to receive it. And so the storm, the rain, it may happen miles away, but it begins to flow. And without even experience, experiencing a single raindrop, the wilderness all of a sudden will have a flow of water usher through. And the people that were there, they may wonder, where in the world is this coming from? I didn't feel a single raindrop. I didn't hear the thunder roll. I didn't see the lightning flash. But God was at work off the scenes preparing what he was about to produce in the wilderness. I don't know if you're getting it this morning or not, but God is telling somebody today, I'm about to turn it around. And your declaration is, ah, you don't know the wilderness that I'm sitting in right here, right now. My response is, you're right, I don't. But this is what I do know, that somewhere off to the side, somewhere in another scene, God is raining down promise that is about to flow into your life. And when they said the streams in the south, they said the streams in the wilderness. If you'll do some more study, you'll find that they actually prepare for this stream of abundance that comes. Even though they may not experience the rain personally, they prepare for it. They anticipate it. They get dams built and they they create this irrigation supply. They study. There's an entire agricultural university that is dedicated to farming the Negev the wilderness, in order to take full leverage, full advantage of the desert. So they're anticipating this flow that will come, but they've got to be prepared for it. They've got to anticipate it. They've got to build dikes, and they've got to build dams, and and they build these levees so that when the water flows in, it's harvested, it's kept there, so that the trees will put roots down, and the soil can be prepared. They build deep dams for trees that push their roots down some 20 yards. They build other dams for cereal that they produce, this grain that will grow up. It's not such a deep harvest, but it comes quickly, and and they anticipate it. They prepare for it. So what I'm saying is God is telling somebody this morning, you need to be prepared for what I'm about to do. I want to give you a dream. I want to give you a vision. I want you to anticipate the work that I'm going to do. I'm about to turn it around, but you've got to be prepared for it.
So somewhere in the simple title of the message that just says, God is going to turn it around. There's a recommendation to get ready. Get ready for what God's about to do. Get ready and build something. Prepare something in your life to catch all that God is about to give you. Let your vessel be available, not filled up with everything that the world has to offer. Dig out the well that you've got so that you can be prepared to receive what God is about to bring. A stream is going to come in the desert. It's going to happen. Get ready for it, CCC. Pelkey, I remember you coming. Ten Morrison Street. He showed up. I don't, he must have been. He must have been over forty-five then. He showed up with his tiller on the back of his truck, and here this elder was coming to help me prepare a garden. He had a front tine tiller. I've learned since that a rear tine tiller is much easier to handle. A front tine tiller is something like holding on to a bucking bronco and hoping it'll take hold in the ground before it takes hold of you. I remember walking around the backyard, tilling up the soil on our little house down on Morrison Street. And this elder was there. I said, Brother Pelkey, let me do that. He'd started it. He said, let me do that. And he was doing it with quite a bit of ease. I grabbed a hold of it and it was something like, Experience is a wonderful thing. So strength. But there's something that we need to prepare for in our lives. In other words, you till the ground up so you can plant the seed in the soil. You till the ground up so that you can prepare it for what is about to come. You want it to be ready to receive the rain when it comes. And God is saying, get ready because I'm about to turn it around. I want to turn it upside down. The enemy thinks he's got you captive, but I'm about to turn it around. where it seems impossible for God to do anything of significance is perhaps one of the greatest greatest opportunities that God will ever give you for greatness break up the ground in our spirit we may not have heard the thunder yet we may not have seen the lightning yet and it may seem like on the horizon there's nothing more than just a cloud the size of a man's hand But I just want to remind us today that there's a storm coming. And we want to be ready to harvest everything that God has for us in the end days. Could you stand together with me? Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Some of you this morning, that needs to be your prayer. Don't be satisfied living below the place that God has intended for you. Dust off a word from God that you got a long time ago. Psalm 84 verse 5, Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee in whose heart are the ways of them who passing through the valley of tears, the valley of weeping, the valley of bondage, they make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. Our text goes on to say, they that sow in tears, in weeping. It says that they shall reap in joy. Why? Because God is able to turn it around. Verse 6, he that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. He just went out with the seed. He went out with brokenness. He went out with barrenness. He went out with just a little bit, but God said, hang on. I'm about to turn it around. If you're ready for what I'm about to do, if you're prepared, if you'll just let me work the way that I want to work, I'm going to do something miraculous. I'm going to do something marvelous. And if we go and we bear precious seed, I love the scripture here. 
we shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing sheaves with us. So we go out, get the picture. We go out in mornings just like this. We get out in mornings when we're weeping, the Bible says. We go out broken. We go out uncertain. We go out, maybe we just got a little bit of doubt because all we've got is a handful of seed. We go out and we're weeping, God, what are you going to do with this little bit? God, what are you going to do through this little me? God, what can you do? What could you possibly do? We go out broken. But if God can break us the way that God wants to break us, if God can get inside of us and stir something up so our flesh falls off and so our worldliness falls off so that his spirit comes on the inside, let me tell you what can happen. A little bit becomes a lot in the hand of God. And all we had to distribute was just a little bit of brokenness and a little bit of seed. Our tears so planted in the soil along with the seed but the scripture says that we shall doubtless come again with rejoicing so we went out like this we went out weeping I don't want to lose you lose us we went out broken. We went out in that worst season of our life. We went out when we thought for sure God had forsaken us. We went out weeping. And all we had was just a little promise. All we had was just Pastor Jack's title of this message. God can turn it around. That's all we had. So we went out weeping. Sowed the seed. Maybe the only water the ground took in was the tears that fell off of our cheeks. But the Bible tells us that if we will sow, there's power in the seed. There's power when that seed hit the soil that you didn't even see. You couldn't conceive it. You didn't understand it. But in the midst of your brokenness, God was doing something. He was breaking the seed down. And the life of the seed happens when the seed has the ability to die. When there's nothing left but death for the seed. But all of a sudden, that seed begins to sprout. It begins to come to life. And it just kind of comes up through the soil. And what you didn't anticipate was a great. Oh God, God's given me a dream this morning. In my flesh, right now, my flesh is telling me, just finish the sermon. I'm beat, I'm tired, my voice is shot overweight, out of shape. But somewhere in my spirit, there's something that steps over top of that. It tells me I got a plan this morning, Pastor Jack. I got a plan for a church at 71 Downing Street. And this is just the beginning. to rejoice like it's already happened. I'm supposed to rejoice like I'm seeing what God is about to do before it's already happened. I'm going to beat the heathen to the punch this morning. And what I'd like to do is kind of hang my head, go up close, dismiss service. But on the inside of me, the spirit man is saying, "Uh uh-uh, there's something more here this morning. There's some people getting a hold of the promise that I've got. And so on the inside, I want to hang my head but on the outside, I'm compelled to thank God in advance for what he's going to do. And I just need three people to join me. I got one. I got two. I got three. I got four. Maybe a few more. in the house. I 
I just need someone to say, God's about to turn it. I know what it feels like on the outside, but God's about to turn it. I don't want to see with my human eye, but spiritually, I got a dream that God gave me. God is about to turn it around. Oh, this is just phase one of the altar call. It's just part one. God wants to give you a chance to sow some seed in some unlikely soil this morning. Come on, you got some precious seed. Tap your neighbor say, I got precious seed this morning. I got seed that can change things. I got seed that will turn it around this morning. your faith out. Let your faith out this morning. Come on, prayer warrior. Pray this morning. us to do this morning. Thank you for responding to the word of the Lord. Thank you for coming to the altar. There's some that are in the pew. You're unable to come to the front, but you're going to receive God's word where you are. That's fine. What I'd like us to do this morning is just get your hand closed like this, would you? If you got seed, just a little seed, but it's precious seed. It's a promise that God gave you, but you haven't seen the fruition of it yet. It's a seed that God gave you, but you haven't seen the promise come to reality yet. It's precious seed. This seed you got in your hand, it costs you something. I'm not going to preach again, but what I'd like to do is in this season right now that we are in, I want to offer it to God. Because I believe that there's a due season coming. 
that we're going to be reminded and we're going to remember what we gave to God in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our valley experience, who passing through the valley of Baca. Make it a well. You made it a well. We got some Job's in the room this morning. You don't understand why you walk through what you're going through, but God has a word for you. For you. The Bible says that God turned it for Job when he prayed for the, his friends. God turned the captivity of Job. Same phrase that we've been talking about. When he prayed for his friends, God wants to release you and the bitterness, the hurt, the unforgiveness that you got in your spirit. God wants to release that in your life because he's got something he's about to do. And God can't work through us as long as we're tainted by bitterness and unforgiveness. So put it in your hand, would you? We're going to offer it to God. We're going to sow it in the spirit. And we're going to watch God do something miraculous. So if you got a word from God this morning, it's just a seed. That's all we're doing. We're going to release it to God. But God's harvest season, he can work in a moment. Trees can spring up overnight. Wells can happen in a minute. The streams can come in the midst of a desert. It can happen. So we're going to give it to God. And in the moment that we give it to God, I want you to thank him for what God is going to do in your life. I want you to lift your voice. I want you to clap your hands. Like Brother Stone King says, let it be uproarious. So in the, just, just in the next moment, I know we're doing it in a season of weeping, in the midst of that valley experience. But I'd like us to give it to God because God is about to turn it around. On the count of three, we're just going to open our hand and release it to God, all right? One, two. Three, give it to God. Come on, so precious seed. God, I pray that you would turn it around. Now, would you clap hands, all you people? I'm not trying to put a cap on it, but I'm just taking it to the next level. Would you lift your voice and thank God for what he's going to do? In the name of Jesus.